Okay, so today we're going to be covering um, updates to USSR in the last couple months. And um, before we get started with that, I do want to mention that we are um, sort of kicking off the uh, Fridays with Fiscal for this part of the year, so we have them planned for the next couple months. On our wiki, we do have a list posted out there, so uh, the state software redesign page. Fridays with Fiscal SSDT webinars. And once we wrap this up, um, I am recording it, so that'll be posted out there. And um, all of these Friday with Fiscal webinars are going to be posted out there. So if you do um, happen to miss one, you can catch it here afterwards. For today, we're going to be talking about the major highlights from releases 7.18 through 7.21. I'm just going to talk about um, the bigger features that have been added. If we talked about every single thing, we'd be here all day. So uh, I want to show you as well that there are notes for all of the release updates and the hot fixes on the wiki as well. And that's going to be in that same section under USAS redesign. And here are all the release notes uh, for everything. Um, posted out here, and these are the ones that uh, there's a link in the email each time you get a release update as well. So I'm going to jump in my database to get started, and I'm just going to kind of go through um, the different features in sections. I do have a database that has the newest release update that's not out yet, 7.22, but that is anticipated next week, so I figured that I would um, go ahead and show some of those features as well, so I will uh, make sure to point those out when we get to um, those things that you won't have in your database yet. Okay, so um, we're going to get started. I'm going to hop down to the system rules and talk about the new rules that have been added first. Um, in here, there are um, a couple different things. They are all optional rules, so none of them are mandatory, have to be turned on with the software. And the first one is a warning um, when invoicing um, when the invoice amount exceeds the remaining encumbrance. Let me just pull that up here. So that's going to be this rule. And we're going to take a look and see what that warning looks like. Um, for uh, this one, it is just a warning. It's not going to be um, something that stops them from putting in the invoice. And it is by default not enabled. So if your districts want to have this be a warning, they would have to come in and enable it. So they would just open the rule, check to enable that, and save. And whenever you are turning on these rules or turning them off, you also have to remember to use this activate button up at the top. So we'll go ahead, click that, and then give it a minute to update. Now for this one, I'm going to actually apply it. We'll go see what it looks like um, on the invoice record. When we look at the next couple rules, I'm not going to activate them all, but um, I just wanted to show you what that looks like. And I probably should have waited a second before I closed out of that pop-up, but it does give you a pop-up, tell you your rule has been applied successfully. So if we go to our transaction page, and I'm going to use the new AP invoices rewrite page, which we'll look at in more detail later because that was one of the updates over the last couple months. Uh, but for now, we're just going to look at this warning. And let me find one.
the one I was planning is not seeing, so let me go ahead just give this one a shot. You know what? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> um, let's start with the purchase order invoice. That, that'll take us to the AP invoices. I'm sorry. I guess I need more coffee. Okay, here we go. That's better. All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, click the invoice button to invoice this PO. Give it an invoice number. I think I'm in June. And then this is um, this PO is for a hundred dollars, but if I um, invoice it for more than that, so let's do one ten. Say that had um, shipping, so. Uh, we're going to include that. We didn't have that in the original purchase order, but we're going to be now paying that extra $10 for shipping or something like that. Um, and then when I go ahead and save this, I get a pop-up. It's green, so the record is still created. The invoice is still made. Um, it's just going to pop up and say, hey, the amount um, that you invoiced exceeds the remaining encumbrance. So if a district wants to um, at least be alerted of that, they could use this. That one was added in May, so it's been in there for some time. Um, this next one as well has been uh, out here since June. Just gonna pull these up. I'm looking for anything that has future in the description. These are rules that were put in place um, that can be activated to allow districts to uh, have balance checking on future year requisitions or purchase orders. So uh, when they get their budgets in, they're in June, and then they have their users start to enter those requisitions for the future year. These rules, if activated, would um, allow them to get warnings or errors if they're going to go over budget based on the next year proposed amount. And they will look at uh, the user setup, so where each individual user has, you know, whether they're going to, whether they're allowed to have, uh, to post negative balances to the budget or appropriation level. Um, it'll take that into account. So probably not something you guys need at this point in the year, but those will be there. Um, for next year. So if that's something your districts want to use, you could enable them now um, so that it's set to go. And the last rule we're going to look at is um, this one is an error. This first one right here, error inactive account on disbursement. So this one's act, um, added in July and it's not mandatory, but it is enabled by default. So um, if you haven't changed this, this one is turned on in your databases. And basically what this one is for is to, um, to throw an error if they are trying to post their payroll um, using inactive accounts. So when they're on that pending transactions page and they go to post, if the payroll accounts that are used are inactive, then it will pop up and give them an error. If you have districts that, um, you know, maybe they don't care, they just want it to post to an inactive account and then they go back and clean those up later, then you could uh, disable this rule, click activate, and then they would uh, be able to not get that error. All right, so that's it for the rules um, that we're going to look at for now. Uh, we're going to switch gears here and go to the report manager. I'm going to cover a couple different updates with the reports. And the first thing, as far as reports that we'll talk about, is probably something that you've all seen and used these different reports. But I want to talk about sort of the difference between, between each one. So actually, 
let me filter this down a little bit better. I'm going to talk about the financial detail reports because now there's three of them out there. Uh, we started with one and then they've sort of been added. So I just want to talk about the difference for each one and how they can be used. This first financial detail report is the one that everyone started with. It's sort of the basic. Um, you can enter in your different report parameters. You can enter in a start date and an end date when you run it. So this one, it defaults to the current period, but would be the one that I would choose if maybe I was trying to track a transaction down uh, from a prior month. So I'm going to run this from April 1st to April 30th or something like that. You want to be careful with this one because if you were to take out the start and end dates and try and run it, it's going to run for all of time. So uh, you do, don't want to do that. Uh, we'll skip down to the financial detail report for the current period. And this one is similar, but no start and stop dates in your generate report option. Um, this one is actually written in to run for the current period. So whatever you have up in the top of uh, the top corner of the screen, that's what data this one is going to be for. Uh, this one is your month end probably. Um, quick and easy, just generate the report. It'll give you like basically your current month date and then that could be compared um, at the end of the month uh, to the figures on a cash summary, say. One thing to note with these reports is um, you do have your um, expended and received amounts, and it also has the encumbrances on it uh, in the last column. When you are running these, keep in mind that those remaining encumbrances that show on there only correspond to the transactions within your date range. So if I run this report for my current period, look at the remaining encumbrance amount in that last column, it's not going to match up to my cash summary that's the entire, that's all of the open encumbrances. Um, it's just looking at different things. So um, when you're looking at that column, just keep that in mind. And this last one here is financial detail report um, for July one, with the July 1 cash balances. Um, this one's pretty cool. It doesn't, we don't see a date range on here, but what this is going to run for is the current fiscal year. So when you get to the point where you're at the end of the fiscal year, like my database is in June, it is going to be a lot of data because um, you're running for, um, because you're pulling all of those transactions from every month. So this one um, can take some time to run if you're trying to run it for everything for an entire fiscal year. Uh, keep that in mind. But um, in the 7.22 release, there is an enhancement to the performance of running this report. So it's a 30% improvement on the performance of that report. So we do have that to look forward to um, as far as making this one a bit better. And I'm not going to run it right now just because uh, my test database, I'm not 100% sure how much info I have in there. So I ran one in advance because I did want to take a look. Um, so here's what this looks like with the July 1st cash balances. It has in the header for each account, um, I would have the beginning balance as of July 1, and then at the end of, of each section for each fund, I'm going to have the ending balance. And if I had this for multiple funds, I would have the beginning and ending for each fund right on there. So that's really nice. Amanda, this is Rhonda from HCC. And um, one difference from the classic report was there isn't a running balance. And also another one is in the classic report, there was a total of the beginning balances and a total of the ending balances for the grand totals. And I was wondering if there would be any development for that in the future. Um, as far as getting the totals for the beginning and ending balance, um, just with how these are, or with how 
they fall on this report um, coming in with the headers. I don't know um, if I don't know that you could do that on the same report. So that may be a separate report that you would um, want to run for those totals. For uh, the running balance, that's something that with how redesign, um, since it pulls all the data uh, real time, that is difficult to be able to put on a report. But we do have a solution for that. And um, since I still have my documentation open, I'm just going to hop over here real quick. Um, our next USAS Fridays with Fiscal is um, September 6th, and we are going to talk about the reports in more detail at that point. Um, but out here in our USAS documentation, in the appendix, there is um, create a financial detail spreadsheet with the running fund balance. So there is a way to do it. You would basically just use the report link and be able to pull it into Excel. And there's a template written and everything. So um, take a look at that. And then that's something that uh, we'll be looking maybe more at, even just how to sort of um, do that process using the report link. OK, thanks so much. No problem. OK, so uh, let's see. If we get back over here to the reports, the next one I want to show is a canned report. Um, if I come up to my menu here, the revenues and expenditures report has been added to this drop down as a canned report. It used to be a template report. This is the rewrite of the Fund RevX classic report. Now, it pulls expenditures and revenue amounts, and at the bottom it calculates a difference. So um, since that's a bit more complex than uh, most of the template reports, they had to rewrite it into one of these um, canned formats. But you do have all of the same options that it had written in um, the, the template report before. So it could be run by cash account or fund. If you wanted to include specific funds, and then there are some options for um, how you would collapse your accounts. Uh, you could run it for a specific posting period. And then if you actually wanted to put a filter on it, um, anything more complex than just like a specific fund, then you do have the option to do that too. I'm going to run it real quick here. So within each cash account that you run this for, it's going to split up revenues and expenditures. And then within those categories, when you get to the expenditures, it'll split up the um, expenses by object level. My understanding is that this report is something that a lot of districts would give to their board because uh, it kind of just breaks it down you know, my salaries, my insurance, my purchase services, it makes it real easy for them to see uh, the different expenses by category. And it shows your month to date activity um, and your fiscal to date activity versus what you budgeted. So if they want to compare, you know, here's how much I had incoming this month versus here's how much I spent in a specific fund, it makes it pretty simple to see. Um, and when you get to the bottom here, I know this one doesn't have any month to date activity, but uh, this grand total is going to calculate the difference between those so that they can sort of see where they're at. The other thing that we see on this report um, is the fact that you can, that it does um, split these out by object levels. So um, this is any object that starts with a one that's in the 100s, any object that starts with a two. So that's what we're going to look at next is uh, a way that you could actually do that on the template reports, or your districts can do that. So if, when you're customizing these, um, I'm going to go into a budget summary here. Yep. 
And um, what I can do is add a property for a report level that I would be able to add a control break on, and then that would give you the subtotals. So um, if I come in, I want to open up the budget category and then the code, and um, we'll see these um, new options out here. So function level one digit, uh, function level two digits, your object one digit level, so that is the option that we saw on um, the revenue and expenditures report. You could even do subject two digit level, so if you're trying to, um, you know, say run uh, or create a report for a specific fund but be able to break out and see those different subjects, there might be multiple subjects within a certain category, but they always start with the first two digits. So all you have to do is just drag one of these over here. Um, what I would do is assign a sort and then make it a control break and maybe suppress it because you don't necessarily need to see it. Um, but those are all out there to use. All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about on the reports for now, I'm going to talk about this one pretty briefly. I mentioned it with the um, financial detail, but this report link is really cool, and I just kind of want to touch on it um, just to make sure everyone's seen it, because I, I think there are going to be a lot of uses um, in the future that we're going to find. So uh, if I come in to generate a report, let me put a fund in here. We'll stick with our cafeteria. Um, in order to create a report link, I would come in, make a save and recall. Once I tab off of that, it'll let me save. And then I get this link icon that'll show up. And if I click that, I have an option um, it gives me a link that I can copy, and then I could save that, I could share it, um, we could use it in Excel, but let's just look at uh, saving it for now. Um, I have two options. I can just have the normal report link, or I can include parameters. Uh, the difference is basically going to be that when this report is run from the link, is it going to... Um, go look at what this save and recall is and use this. Um, right now it is, but if I don't include the parameters and then the person who made the save and recall comes in here and changes what that cafe means, then the report that gets run later would also change. But if I click to include the parameters, then it's always going to know that this should be for just the 006. Um, there are different times where you may or may not use it. Uh, it right now, it, I mean, it's kind of new, so, you know, it just, it really depends on if your users, how they're using those save and recall, and, um, you know, if they're creating those for other things and then using a report link from them, it, they could potentially change it and unintentionally, you know, change the report link. If you are going to use this with Excel, you don't want to include the parameters because that makes the link very long and uh, that can cause problems. But for today, we'll leave our parameters on. I just right click, copy the link address, and then get a new, sorry, my um, little pop-up was over that here. And I could open a new web page uh, paste that link, I could email that link and then someone could click on it. And when you open it, now I'm not sure if it's going to let me or if it's going to ask me to sign in right now since I'm already in another tab. Maybe I should grab a different browser. Okay, so if I come in a different browser, it's going to ask me to sign in. Um, this does not have to be the same person that created the report link signing in. Uh, 
but it does have to be somebody that has a login to USAS. So if your treasurer is going to email a report link to a principal, they would need to have uh, USAS credentials to be able to access that. So kind of a cool way to share secure information. What do I get going on here? I promise I tested this. Oh, it's because it's a PDF. Sorry, guys. All right, so um, it just popped up at the bottom there, but I signed in, so it gave me my report. So then um, once I provide my credentials, I pop up, it pops up, and I get the PDF um, right from that link. Amanda, I have a question. You were talking mm -hmm. about how um, you could use that link in Excel. What would you do mm -hmm. with that? There is an option under um, the Get Data that used to be used like for Safari, um, and it's called Get Data from URL. And you would be able to use the link within there to, um, to pull data into a spreadsheet. Um, there is sort of an example of it on that appendix page, and that, I mean, that gives the example of the financial detail, but you could really um, kind of use that process for anything, and I will definitely be talking about that on September 6th. So Thank we'll, you. we'll go through it there, no problem. The other thing that I, I feel like is cool with um, this report link, like especially like this if I'm using a PDF option, is that I could create a bookmark with the link. So if I um, favorite this or in Google, you know, if I make it one of my bookmarks, then um, when I want to run that report, you know, if I, you know, I mean, a lot of people could go in and just log in here, but sometimes different district users, like they may not want to go directly into USAS or, you know, maybe they just want a different way to access it. But if they favorite the link, let me do this. So I just pasted my link up there. Oops, no, nope. wrong part. This is where I want to give it a name. and I could have the URL, I could save that, and then the next time I want to run it, I could just click right here, log in, and get that PDF of my BUDSUM based on the current figures, because that is going to run real time. So that one, that one kind of fun, definitely a lot of possibilities. All right, so um, I'm gonna switch gears. We're kind of working backwards on this list, but uh, the next step I wanna hit is budgeting. I'm gonna go into the scenarios here. I know that uh, at least the initial budgeting is done for this year, um, but there were a couple things that were added and um, one of these could come in handy still. Um, if I have a current scenario in here, they updated it so that you have the ability to clone scenarios now. So this year, most people were budgeting for the first time. Everyone had to kind of go in, create theirs um, to start. But next year, they may not want to create all of their spreadsheets again, or maybe it just would be easier to be able to copy last year, make it um, the new year. Or right now, they probably did their temporaries and they're going to be doing their permanents. Um, they could modify the current scenario, but you know maybe they want to save a permanent, or I'm sorry, a temporary and a permanent scenario for each year. So all they would have to do is come in, uh, click the view, and now there is an option to clone that scenario. Close one of my extra windows while we're waiting for that to pop up.
All right, so once it um, gives us our copy, so it's going to give us all the same um, budgeting sheets and everything in there, I can give this a new name. And any um, updates that I want to make to the budgets, I could, you know, edit the sheet right from here. Or if I wanted to uh, download and upload the same functionality that you had before with the scenarios. And once they um, are done making their updates or, I mean, they could always go back in and make updates, they would just be able to save that budget scenario, budgeting scenario, and um, then they would have two. But I do want to show um, if they are cloning it from last year to the next year, then when they're in here, they have to remember to change this header on this column. Um, when I clone it, so this one was for 2020, it's going to make me a new scenario, an exact copy, so this still shows for 2020. So when they are cloning to the new year, all they'd have to do is come in here, change this header to PA 2021, accept that, and then um, they'd be able to use it for the next year. Uh, there are a couple other things that were added when we create a new budget sheet. Um, so if I create this, it opens my um, view, uh, sort of like a report view um, with the options that I would use to make a new budgeting sheet here. And I'm not going to save this. So um, if I gave it a name, then I would come down here. Here are the default columns that are going to show in my spreadsheet. There were some updates that changed these around just to kind of make it more convenient. And um, the big thing is we have these prior year expendable expended columns. But now there are also uh, three-year prior expended and two-year prior expended. So those were in there before the end of the fiscal year, so your treasurers may have um, found those, used those, maybe you were looking for them. Um, but that definitely makes it, you know, makes it easier for them. I know that's something that was on the classic Budwork, so um, those are out there. Okay, I'm going to... Save this. And once that clone scenario is saved, you know, I mean, it's just like a normal scenario. You can promote it to the proposed, um, to the next year proposed when you're ready. And um, that, that whole process is the same there. All right, I'm trying not to jump around too much, but there were updates all over the place. So um, we're going to go next to the extracts. I want to quickly show um, that there is an online checkbook extract now. So for those districts that use the um, state treasurer's online checkbook, that is through uh, ohiotreasurer.gov. In Classic, they ran a little program to get an extract, and this um, basically creates the same extract for them. Um, this is something that they usually use, I think, either quarterly or monthly. So all they would do is come in here, enter the start and uh, end dates for the data that they want to pull. And then if there are any cash accounts that they exclude, they would enter that in. And then they'd be able to generate a CSV file. They would then have to take that CSV file and uh, submit it to the OhioTreasurer.gov website. All right. Um, so next, we're going to. Uh, the users page. I'm going to talk about um, auto assigning numbers for requisitions. So we'll take a look at those fields and then an example here. 
I'm going to come in. I made my little Amanda user. So this is a requisition only user. And um, if I want to have that user, uh, when they create requisitions, they can leave the rec number blank and it will auto assign a number starting with uh, whatever characters I would enter in. So the box is for requisition prefixes. My example, this user is gonna have their rec start with SK and with this current setup, they could still see uh, all recs because I do not have the restrict requisitions checked. This is just simply to auto assign. This can be used in combination with restricting requisitions. So if I want my user to be able to enter requisitions that start with SK and then also only see requisitions that start with SK, I check the restrict requisitions box, and then that's what they're gonna see. If you want a user to uh, be able to see multiple prefixes, uh, so I want them to see anything that starts with SK and DR, I do a comma, no space, and then put in um, that additional prefix that I want them to see. Whichever one is listed first is going to be the one that's used for auto assign. And those requisition prefixes uh, are not allowed to contain special characters. But they, you can put numbers in there, though. So let me go ahead and save this up. And I'm gonna go log in as this user real quick and we'll just watch it auto assign. You know, passwords never work when you're um, in front of people. Just how it goes. I shouldn't go reset it. <laughs> okay, let's try this one more time. There we go. All right, so um, if I come into my transaction menu, look at the requisitions, I only have anything that starts with DR and SK. I noticed in uh, my test database, so they did like DR17, uh, DR18, so maybe, you know, if districts wanted to use some sort of series that had like the first two of the fiscal year, uh, maybe they would do something like that. Um, although they'd have to go change those each year, so I don't know that I like that idea that much, uh, but I have seen, have seen it used. Um, if I create a requisition, I'm gonna leave that blank. And then I'm just kind of put in the bare minimum here just so we can see. Okay, once the information's entered, I click save. And um, if there are existing requisitions with that, um, with that prefix already, it actually went in, you know, it can keep track of that. It'll just add one uh, to the next number or to the prior number to increment. Um, another thing to point out here is, you know, now I'm in my rec only uh, user, I only have just this one page for requisitions under um, transaction. That is something with 7.22, that legacy requisition page is going to be um, actually done now. 
So uh, just, you know, I know that that one's kind of been uh, planned to come out for a while, but it will actually uh, be retired after this next release is installed. Oh, the other thing, didn't, don't really need to look at it when we're in the rec-only user, but um, just since we're talking about rec-only users, uh, one of the updates that happened as well was to make sure that if a district uses ACH fields, then any users with USAS rec um, only will not be able to see those ACH fields. So if they go into the vendors, that is um, restricted. All right, so now we're going to go into the AP Invoices page uh, for real this time. <laughs> and um, you can see that the legacy version is still out here. Um, we are leaving that out there for the time being. Um, the grid is in place. We'll take a look at creating an AP Invoice um, in here, but there are um, there are some issues or like enhancement requests that have been reported and are in progress with the AP invoices. Um, some of those will be resolved in 7.22, but if you uh, if your users run into issues with this page, the go-to workaround is going to be um, to use that legacy page. Uh, but please, you know, report anything that you run into uh, with that because we we do have several issues in progress. Um, it is still nice to have this grid out here, though. It's pretty convenient for searching if you need to uh, look things up, you know, maybe see all the invoices associated with a certain PO. Um, and, oh, and then when we go to the purchase order page and you invoice directly from there, it is going to automatically go to that new AP invoice page, uh, sort of like we saw earlier. Let me find, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull this um, new invoice page up again. My information entered here. You'll notice this um, does have the date and then it also still has that vendor invoice date field. That field is going to be um, excuse me, a good one to use for your districts because um, I know that a lot of times they want to put the date that's on their paper invoice. Um, because redesign works on dates and transaction dates, that date field, the first one up here, you know, this is going to be the transaction date. So you do want that to be in the current period. The vendor invoice date gives them the option to enter whatever date is on their paper invoice and have a way to track that. And then down here, so, you know, we have, we can enter our amount. Our item status. Um, and then when we save, it would create the invoice. Um, this page, I want to point out, there are uh, definitely updates, even just showing here, that we're going to see in 7.22. So um, the first thing, there um, were some issues reported with filling invoices, where if you would click fill, it would click, or it would fill the full amount instead of the remaining encumbrance. That will be resolved. Um, and then there was another error that people were getting with the item status, uh, if there were multiple items and uh, you didn't put the status in each one, even if you weren't invoicing it, it was thrown in error, that's going to be resolved as well. Um, the one that we can see here, check number, not relevant when we're creating an invoice, but after I make this invoice, post it, and assign a check number to that disbursement, I can go back in and see the check number that's associated with each line. So um, that's pretty convenient if you're um, going back and looking um, at your invoices. 
So that will be coming out in the next release. And the other thing, when I entered this amount in here, it does um, update real time in my invoice total. So my canceled total or my invoice total, as soon as I tab off that field, it um, calculates up there. So that is like the classic update where if you had multiple line items, you'd enter everything in, you'd click update and make sure that that total on all of those different lines would equal um, what you intended to pay. So that um, happens before you save now to um, give you that double check. Okay, so I will save that. Um, you do also have the option to create invoices right from this invoice grid. So if you click create, it would pop up and then you'd be able to enter the PO number, click create, and then get to that same um, AP invoice page. Andrea, I have a question. Sure. Do they plan on doing like a search field there that you would be able to search all of your POs when you're trying to invoice against them? Um, I don't believe I've seen anything for a search field. Um, I think if I was going to search for a PO, I would go to the PO grid and then um, filter my grid there and then just use that uh, icon to invoice. Did the legacy invoice gr uh, screen, though, have the ability to search by PO? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, okay. I can check and see if there are any issues out there for it. Okay. Otherwise, I can log a ticket to or yeah. Uh, why don't uh, you do that thing? Okay. All right, yeah. Thank send you. a send a request in. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions about um, that invoice grid or anything that we've covered so far? All right, then I'm going to roll into um, another update from 7.22. This is probably the one I'm most excited about. Uh, mass ad accounts is being um, added. So we're going to take a look at how that's going to work. Uh, if I come into my core accounts page and navigate to the cash account grid, I'm going to be able to find that mass ad option uh, within the view um, within the view option of the account that I want to copy from. So I'm going to pick a 439 because usually, you know, they're going to be copying their accounts from um, one year to the next. So I have a 2019 account here. When I click to open that up, there's going to be a button for mass add right at the top. And when I click that, um, it'll show me the old fund and special cost center, and then um, I can copy those to uh, create new accounts. It would be in the same fund, but I can now assign a new special cost center for the new year. All right, and then I just click submit. I tested this one. It didn't have too many, so um, we should be able to get our pop-up pretty quick. You do want to be careful. Um, I believe that uh, the cash account has to not already exist. So when you're using this, um, it's for creating, it's going to create the new cash account. Um, so I can see my information all here. It created my new cash account, created my appropriation level and the expenditure accounts. And uh, just like Classic, that took any accounts that existed in the prior Fund Special Cost Center and created a corresponding account with the new Fund Special Cost Center. And if I come out here, I'm just going to go to my expenditure grid and look at these real quick.
and now I have my fiscal year 20 um, preschool accounts. So I'm very excited for that one. I think um, our treasurers are going to be as well. So um, let's see. I have one more thing that is 7.22 and um, under the reports here, the accounts payable report. This was classic payable um, report. And uh, you would come in here. It has uh, similar options to classic. Honestly, I um, didn't run this one a whole lot in uh, the classic system, but I know some districts um, really did. So that was added as well. And that one looks like this. So um, gives you your PO date, invoice date, um, your account. And it also utilizes um, the breakdown by the function with two digits. So we'll see that you know, over on the left here. So that will be added as well. Okay, um, that is all I have as far as the updates um, for USAS today. And then next week, next Friday, will be the USPS updates. Uh, that'll be um, at 9 o'clock. So uh, keep an eye out for that one. Um, does anybody else have any other questions today? All right, well, I'll hang out for another minute if anybody else does have questions, but um, thank you all for signing in today and have a great weekend.